Hi, I'm William Spaniel. Let's learn about international relations. Today's topic is bargaining over proliferation. And the big question for the lecture is, why do nuclear-capable states not develop weapons? So if I have the ability to acquire a nuclear bomb, to detonate a nuclear bomb, to test some nuclear bombs and construct some nuclear bombs, why don't I? And of course, this is an important question because, as we saw in the last lecture, we know that states with nuclear weapons tend to get better outcomes in coercive bargaining. So why, as a possible nuclear power, would I not actually develop those nuclear weapons knowing that I could do better by constructing those in a future crisis? And what we're going to see in this lecture is three explanations for why states might not want to proliferate. First is the threat of preventive war, the second is the cost of proliferation, and the third are bribes from declining states. Now this is the basis of my dissertation, so if you're interested in more about this topic, there is a link in the video description that will take you to the article in which I discuss the, the model that I will be talking about right now. So in this paper, I have a, a basic model of nuclear proliferation and the decision to proliferate. So we have two stages. There's a stage where there are no nuclear weapons, the rising state has not proliferated, and there is a second stage, a post-shift stage, where the rising state has nuclear weapons. So in this pre-shift bargaining stage, the declining state's going to offer a bribe to the rising state. The rising state will see that amount that the declining state's offering and choose whether to accept it and not proliferate, reject it and fight a war, or build a nuclear weapon. And if the rising state accepts or rejects, either by taking the bribe and saying, thank you, I'm not going to do anything, or by rejecting and fighting a war, either way, the game ends. And if the rising state develops a nuclear weapon, then we shift into this post-shift bargaining stage, where again, the declining state's going to offer a bribe. And here, the rising state's just going to accept or reject it based off of that amount. Obviously, the rising state's not going to choose whether to proliferate or not here because it already has the nuclear weapons. All right, so what's going to happen in this game? Well, think about what happens in the post-shift period. The bargaining model of war tells us that fighting is costly, so states should reach a peaceful settlement. That's just war's an efficiency puzzle. And in this post-shift period, you have to note that the rising state has nuclear weapons, so it's more powerful. And so as the declining state, I'm going to have to give you more as the rising state in order to buy you off. So if we ever do reach this post-shift bargaining stage, the declining state's going to be paying a lot to the rising state to get the rising state not to fight a war against it. So the outcome is peaceful, but it's very bad for the declining state because the rising state has so much extra power. All right, so we can plug that back into the model here. So we know that if we ever advance to this post-shift stage, that this is going to end peacefully with the rising state receiving great concessions. So the question then becomes, what is the declining state going to do about that? Knowing that if it doesn't convince the rising state to build a nuclear weapon, then it's going to be in this world where the rising state's going to get a lot and the declining state's not going to get very much. Well, Four different outcomes can happen, and it depends on the extent of the power shift and the cost of nuclear weapons. So we see the x-axis is the cost of nuclear weapons. On the left side, that would be when nuclear weapons are extremely cheap. And on the right side, that would be when nuclear weapons are extremely expensive. On the y-axis here, we're varying the extent of the power shift. If the power shift is very minimal, then we're toward the bottom. But if there's going to be a huge shift in power, if nuclear weapons give the rising state a whole bunch of power relative to the status quo distribution, Distribution, then we're higher up on that power shift scale. And the first outcome depends on how high the power shift is. So if the power shift is going to be great, then we're in a world that is essentially too hot for proliferation. So what happens here is if the extent of the power shift is really great and the rising state tries to develop a nuclear weapon, the declining state's going to be like, heck no, we're not going to allow that to happen, and we're going to fight a preventive war. So knowing that if I were to proliferate, suppose I'm the rising state and I decide to proliferate, if I know that that is going to inspire the wrath of the declining state and they're going to fight a war against me, well, then my investment in the nuclear weapons is a waste. I'm paying some cost to develop a nuclear weapon and I'm never actually going to get it because the, the declining state's going to fight a war against me. So if that's the case, the declining state can deter the rising state from developing nuclear weapons purely out of this coercive threat of preventive war. And the declining state can get away with offering no concessions to the rising state, no sort of bribe to the rising state, and still have the rising state not develop a nuclear weapon, knowing that the alternative is, is preventative war and a waste in that investment cost in nuclear weapons. So that's the too hot case.
well, what about the other case? What about the other side of things? Would that be the too cold side? And that's when the cost of nuclear weapons is too great relative to the extent of the power shift. So think about this in the extreme. So in the bottom right-hand corner, where the costs of nukes are really expensive and there isn't much of a shift in power. If that's the case, it doesn't really make sense for me to develop nuclear weapons because I'm not really getting very much bang for my buck. Nuclear weapons are an investment in the future, and I'm just not getting very much back on my investment. So that's what happens in the extreme case. And of course, if we move a little bit toward the middle there, it's still going to be the case that it's just too costly for, for me to develop a nuclear weapon relative to what I get if I'm the rising state. So in that case, when the cost of nuclear weapons is too great relative to the power shift, that's why we have a diagonal line there, then we're in this world that's too cold for proliferation. And again, the declining state can offer no concessions to the rising state, and the rising state still has to accept it because it can't really adequately proliferate because it's just too costly to do so. All right, well, if we have a Goldilocks and three bears analogy here, we have too hot and too cold, you might think that the middle range would be just right for proliferation. And well, that's kind of true. It's not all the way true because there's this big space in the middle where bargaining actually works. So why do bribes work? Why is the declining state able to bribe the rising state and convince the rising state not to develop nuclear weapons? Well, think about what happens if the rising state does proliferate. We know that the declining state will have to give concessions, but this is bad for the declining state, right? The declining state doesn't really want to have to give all of those concessions later on. And so an alternative for the declining state is to just give the concessions or give most of the concessions up front. Now, if I do this, if I'm the decli declining state and I give you basically what you're expecting to get if you were to proliferate, this appeases you as the rising state. You're happy because you're getting basically what you would be getting if you were to proliferate and you're not paying that cost of nuclear weapons, right? So I'm actually kind of saving you the expense by going ahead and just conceding what you want. If you were to proliferate, I'm saving you that cost of proliferation. So you're happy and you don't want to build at that point. And of course, I as the declining state am quite happy too because I end up in a world where you're not developing the new nuclear weapons. My bribes succeed. Now, it's important to note here that this works even if the rising state could freely proliferate. Remember, in the very beginning of this series on international relations, we talked about the idea of anarchy and how there really isn't any sort of quid pro quo style bargaining in international relations. I can't just say, all right, I'm going to give you this deal. I'm going to make this concession to you. I'm going to give you this bribe, but only if you are going to for sure not develop the nuclear weapons, right? So what happens if there's no sort of enforcement mechanism? You can kind of do those sorts of bargains in like the United States because we have contracts that bind the parties to the agreements. But you know, you might be concerned that if there aren't those sorts of binding contracts in international relations, these sorts of, of bribes won't actually work. But as it turns out, it's fine, even if you don't have quid pro quo bargaining, even if the declining state is strategically vulnerable in that I have to give the concessions to the rising state and then the rising state may or may not take those concessions and say, thank you very much, joke's on you, and go ahead and proliferate anyway. I have to be cautious about that, right? Because the, the rising state is free to do this. But as it turns out, because I'm aware of this fact, I'm cognizant of the fact that the rising state could do this to me, I can just tailor my offer size accordingly. I can give you a little bit more than what I would have to do otherwise to make sure that this bargain looks nice enough for you to take it. And of course, this actually works. The rising state gets what it wants, essentially, more or less. It's getting virtually all of all of what it would get if it were to build. And so this is the reason that the rising state doesn't want to build. It has no incentive to. Even if it does build, it may get more concessions, but it's the additional concessions that it would get are not going to cover that cost of proliferation. So really, this cost of proliferation is key to drive bargains and, and to make these sorts of bargains sustainable. Now, the last case is that black box on the left here. In that black box, you actually get proliferation. The reason for that, though, is that the United, or rather, the declining state just doesn't doesn't really care enough to make sure that the rising state won't build. And the reason for that is because the cost of nuclear weapons are so cheap there that the amount of concessions the declining state would have to give up in order to get the, the rising state to not build is really high. And so at that point, the declining state kind of throws its hands up in the air and says, well, it's going to be so hard to stop the rising state from building that we're just going to take everything up front while we still can and force the rising state to proliferate, knowing that there will be consequences for that. Either way, though, you see a lot of situations where we don't have proliferation, either because the declining state's leveraging preventative war, or it's just too costly to proliferate, or because the declining state's being proactive and buying off 
the rising state. So we end up with a lot of situations where we don't see proliferation. Now, this is a good model. It's very useful to understand why these sorts of bargains work, but it's not a, a fully rich model. So one particular issue that you might be concerned about is that everything about this world is staying relatively static over the course of time, except for the possibility that the rising state could build and will transition into a, a world where there's more power in the future. Of particular note here, the declining state doesn't have any sort of variability in the long term about its threat to launch preventive war. And the reason I highlight that is because think about the United States right now. The United States has recently fought in Iraq and Afghanistan, and it's really drained the U.S. resources for another war. So for right now, for a, sh a short time period, it's going to be difficult for the United States to fight another war. And this is important because as we're negotiating with Iran, Iran is being really intransigent on its nuclear program, and the United States isn't making any progress in trying to get the uh, Iran and the United States aren't making any progress to reach a sort of non-proliferation agreement. And in the next lecture, I'm going to talk about that directly. So big question in international relations right now, what's going on with Iran? We're going to use an extension of this model to explain it. So I hope you join me then because I think it is really important to understand probably the most important thing going on in IR right now other than perhaps North Korea, South Korea. Hope you enjoyed this and I hope to see you next time. Take care.